Hello artists, I'm Delina Femme and you're watching day 48 of the Epic Journey where we start to answer questions. Today's question comes from Elise Day. She's asking about backgrounds and underpainting. So, let's get into the talk. for your question while I was in fact recording this answer I got another message came through from Morag Morag has asked a question that fits in quite nicely with this one Morag is asking us a question about different styles of paintings Morag keep watching because later on we will refer to styles because there is a plan and I will let you know uh, through the course of this video what the plan is to deal with the different styles but first of all to talk about Elise's question Elise asks Backgrounds. When do you do it? Must it have an underpainting layer? And how do you make them lively? She also then asks underpaintings. How else can one do underpaintings? I use the old master's technique. Alright, now this is an incredibly long story to answer, Elise. It's not one simple answer. So I'm going to deal with it in little sections. First we'll start talking about your backgrounds. I have a very irritating dog on my lap. First we're going to refer to your background question. Now, when you say when do you do it, I'm assuming what you mean is at what stage of the painting process do you paint your background. Now, of course, as you know with art, there's no wrong or right answer. There's just a good way and a bad way possibly, and every different person will work differently. So everything that I'm going to tell you now related to this particular answer is obviously open to debate. When to do your background. Now, it's probably the best thing to refer to the painting behind me. When you do your background, you do your background at the same time that you do your foreground. It's actually as simple as that. The best way to describe that is that if you paint either your background first or your foreground first, one of two things can happen. If you paint your background first and then you paint your foreground over it, you're not going to get very good integration between your brush strokes of your foreground and your brush strokes of your background. So what happens then is that it ends up looking like a cutout that's been stuck, pasted on top. It, it looks quite separate from your background. You want nice integration and the only way that that really works is when you're working with wet on wet. Even if you're not the kind of artist that works with wet on wet, it is still a good idea to work with your background and your foreground paintings wet at the same time. You want to be able to, that transition zone between your foreground and your background, you want to slightly soften that line so that it doesn't look like it's been cut out and stuck on. So in terms of when to do it, it would be at the same time. So you would build your painting up in layers, foreground and background simultaneously. Must you have an underpainting layer, she asks. Well, no, you don't have to have an underpainting layer. Of course, you can paint straight onto your white canvas. Now, she asks this question relative to backgrounds, but uh, the same would apply to anything, foreground, background, any element. You don't have to have an underpainting layer, but an underpainting layer lends an enormous amount of quality to your artwork. And that's where we go into the next part of the conversation, so we'll get back to that. The other question she asks is, how do you make your backgrounds lively? Well, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. First of all, by doing an underpainting. That is probably one of the best ways to make your backgrounds lively. By not smoothing out your brush strokes too much. I find a lot of artists want to make everything so glossy smooth, get rid of every tiny little brush stroke, that eventually everything just flattens. You don't have enough contrast left over, there's not enough definition between the transition zones from your, your high values to your low values, and everything starts to look really flat and not very lively at all. So brush strokes not being too pedantic about being too smooth in your backgrounds, making sure that your backgrounds have got an underpainting. Now of course you can reproach your underpainting from different angles as well. You can put down a similar color like what I've done in the back of this painting for example where I've put down colors that are similar to the colors that are going to go on top of them. So what happens is then the subsequent layers become nice and dense because you've got an underpainting layer behind it that blocks out the white of your canvas and allows your colors to have good coverage that gives them a lively appeal. But there is another way to do it as well. You can also give your underpainting layer 
the opposite colors. Now, if you have a look at your color wheel, if I was going to do this in opposite colors, my greens would have red behind. I'm giving them the opposite color, and not in this case, but one would. If you wanted to use opposite colors, you would give them the opposite color on the color wheel. So if you were painting purple, you could do a yellow underpainting, or if you were painting yellow, you could do a purple underpainting. And the reason for this is an optical illusion that takes place called juxtaposition. When you put two colors next to one another, even in minute amounts, the smaller amount, let's say for example you're painting a tree and you put little flecks of red into it, it makes your green just look that much more alive. And underpainting in an opposite color is a very similar thing. Although you are painting on top of that color and you would possibly pretty much block out that color, the, the presence of your underpainting in an opposite color is going to lend a very vibrant appeal to the color that you then put on top of it. So that is another good reason why we do an underpainting as well. It is very common for artists to do an underpainting under their paintings and there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, Van Gogh said that uh, um, artists are frightened of a white canvas. Now I wouldn't necessarily agree with it, I don't think a white canvas frightens me, but it is, Picasso is known to have said that starting to paint on a white canvas is likened to jumping into a cold swimming pool. That I kind of would relate to a little bit more. A white canvas can be quite intimidating, so an underpainting can almost like the term that I used for this painting behind me, it activates your canvas. It gets your painting started and it, it begins the process on a soft note almost. So that's probably one of the best psychological reasons behind an underpainting. But there's a lot of other reasons behind an underpainting as well. Because it lends density to your color. You get good coverage and you get good light reflection. What we've got to understand with, with paint, oil paint or acrylic, but particularly with oil paints, is that you get this optical illusion happening, or you get this optical mixing of colors happening, and your underpainting can add to that process. Now the second part of Elisa's question, she uses the old master's technique, so what are the other ways that one can do an underpainting? Now, there's a couple of different ways that one can do an underpainting within the old master's techniques. But Elisa, if you're referring to how else other than master, old master's techniques can you do an underpainting, well there are no rules. Many artists assume that one must do an underpainting in acrylic because watercolors must go down first and then oil colors on top of that. You can't m do it the other way around. You can't put acrylics on top of oils because oil and water don't mix and the drying process is very different and we will go into the technical side of that at some other stage uh, but what I'll address right at the moment is that if you do an underpainting in oils you cannot put acrylics on top of that because your underpainting of your oils takes a very long time to dry and the drying process prohibits the acrylic from sticking to the underpainting and it will eventually flake off. You can do it the other way around where you can put acrylics underneath oils your acrylic being water-based dries very quickly. You've got to make sure that it's incredibly dry though before you start painting your, um, your oils on top of it. But there is no reason why one has to do a painting in acrylics, an underpainting, sorry, in acrylics. It is actually better to do your underpainting in oils. And that's where I was talking in a couple of videos ago where you mix your oils with terps, a lot of terps, a little bit of oil to make sure it's still got its binding properties. Oils bind to your canvas a lot better on a molecular level than acrylics do. Now that also brings me to the gesso. When you buy a canvas, it is already coated in a white gesso layer. That white gesso is latex paint. That itself doesn't have very good binding properties. And what a lot of artists do is that they will then reprime that canvas. Even if they haven't made that canvas themselves from scratch, they will reprime that canvas with an auto primer. Any auto primer that you buy at the hardware store is designed to grip well and it's designed to hold on to oil paints so it increases the bonding properties of your canvas itself. So even if you, it, look if you're painting straight onto gesso, not a problem, it's, it's not an issue, it's just archivally in 50 to 60 years time your painting may start to fade because you're painting it onto an acrylic latex paint. Whereas if you prime it first with an auto primer, you're now painting oils on oils and you're not going to have that same archival issues that you would have if you were painting onto an acrylic background. And for the same reason, you don't want to activate your canvas with acrylic. Although it is very, very commonly understood that one must do one's activation layer or one's underpainting layer in acrylic, that is not necessarily the case. In fact, the opposite is true. If you're painting in oils, it's probably better to do your activation layer or your underpainting layer in oils. 
As far as underpainting goes in terms of the old masters, Elise, if you were requesting an answer in terms of the different ways the old masters do it, there's basically three different ways that the old masters would do it. In classical painting, you have a very traditional way of laying down the colors. Your imprimatura layer, which would have been your underpainting, your very first layer that went straight onto the canvas, onto the prepared canvas. Traditionally, they would have used a wash of very watered down with dark brown or um, raw amber. Uh, raw amber is a very popular color to use and I think that's because we are taught often as artists that's just the, that's just the way to do it and this is why I particularly like Elise's question because Elise is asking why and it's good as an artist to ask why. Why is it that we have to use raw umber? Well there's we don't have to use raw umber we can actually use whatever color we like but traditionally raw umber, burnt sienna, uh, calico, van dyke brown those were the colors that were the, the earth colors that were used for both um, the imprimatura layer and the subsequent sketch layer. Now we'll go up through the layers so that I can explain to you why that underpainting layer is so important. What they would do is they would put their raw umber washed down, very light wash of raw umber. If they were doing a dark painting they could make it slightly darker otherwise it would end up almost a creamy color. And then what they would do is they would sketch but in very high tonal detail so it would have the full range of values from very darks to very lights. Now the very darks would obviously be the raw umber. Remembering that the raw umber would be very it would be very thin down, so you're going to have quite a lot of turps in it. But your darker areas of your painting are going to be in full raw umber value, and your lighter areas of the painting are going to be the canvas, no white. Now this is I say this quite emphatically because it is a very uh, commonly mistaught practice that one has to do one's underpainting layer in raw umber and white. If you're going to use white, you don't have to use white. It's preferable that you don't use white, that you just do it in your raw, plain raw umber. But if you're going to use white, you use very small amounts and you use one of your soft mixing whites like your flake or your zinc white. You don't use titanium white, it's far too thick and you don't want to put a lot of white down early on in your painting, particularly titanium white because it's brittle and the earlier layers of your painting might end up cracking so you want to leave your titanium white until later if you're going to be using titanium white you leave it until later and then you give it a lot of oil obviously in terms of how the art the, the old masters used to layer their paintings first would come their underpainting that was a wash a single plain wash of color then they would do one of three things they would either do a vidaccio layer or they would do, I've got it written down here so that I don't forget anything. They do a Vidaccio layer, a Vidaya layer, or a Grisaille layer. Now your Vidaccio layer is a combination of black, white, and yellow. So it come, becomes quite greenish. So your underpainting would be again in full value. It would be almost the finished product, but in one color mixed with those, made up of those three colors mixed together. And like I say, no white, but otherwise in full value. So you're gonna end up with your imprimatura layer and then your Vidaccio layer on top of that. It appears to be almost a monotone but pretty much complete painting at this stage. If they don't do a Vidaccio layer, they would do a Vidai layer. Now the Vidai layer came into fashion in the 12th century when um, color was prohibited in the monasteries. Uh, they were only allowed to paint in certain colors, so what they would do then is they would do their underpainting in shades of green because that is what they were permitted to use. The, a lot of the colors were prohibited to the, monastery, the, the monks in the monasteries back in the 11th and 12th centuries. So the Vidai layer is simply, it, it was born out of necessity. The Grisaille layer, the Grisaille layer is what you would do in place of a brown layer. So you would use black and white, again not your titanium white, you would use one of your soft whites and you would do your entire painting in, in high level of, of completion in full range values but only in black and white. Now another common misconception is that some of the modern artists feel that they must do an, an imprimatura layer and they must do the Vidaccio layer and then they must do the Grisaille layer, they must do all of those layers. You don't have to. You would do your imprimatura layer which was your wash, then you would do your brown layer which was referred to as a brunei layer, brunei meaning brown and that would be your raw umber, be either your Vidacci, your Vidai or your Grisaille, not all three of them. And then after your other painting, of course, you would have your uh, glaze layers. So to recap, from, from back layers to front layers, you would have your imprimatura layer, you would then have your underpainting layer, you would have your overpainting layer, and then all your glaze layers on top of that. Your imprimatura layer being a wash of color, 
your underpainting layer be your raw umber only, your overpainting layer would be your dead layer, and then of course you would have your, your glaze layers over that. So to get back to Elisa's um, question, I use the old masters technique, what other ways are there? Well those are all the different ways that I've described to you now that the old masters would have used. The other ways are pretty much anything goes. In modern contemporary paintings you would possibly do an entire wash over a canvas that is very commonly used. You could do what I've done here where you've used different colors underneath various different colors of your painting to add depth. You could use opposite colors like I described earlier on. Whatever it is that you do though, whatever underpainting um, method you choose to do, remember one thing specifically, very thin paints. They must be thin. And by thin, I mean your underpainting layer or your, your wash over your entire canvas, what would be called the imprimatura layer, would be probably about 80 to 90% of turps and a little bit of oil just to make up that, that uh, binding properties of, that, um, of your oil paint. Your underpainting layer would then be done in a 75-25% mix and so you would get fatter. Remember the fatter over lean story we talked about a couple of videos ago? Your paint would get fatter and fatter as it goes through until eventually when you're getting to the glaze layers you're working entirely in fat, in other words entirely in oil. Now the nice thing, the one thing that you need to remember for your glaze layers is that the modern day alkyd mediums that we use dry far too quickly. It's not a good idea to use alkyd mediums unless you're an incredibly fast painter and I'm fast and I find alkyds dry too quickly for glaze layers. So it's a good idea to either use safflower oil or linseed oil because they dry a lot slower so it gives you a lot more time. What happens if you use alkyd and it dries too quickly is you get little halos because your alkyd will dry and your brush will almost wipe it off and then you get a little halo and it's very very difficult to get rid of that. You've pretty much got to wipe the whole layer off and start again. But with linseed oil, because it dries so slowly, you don't get that happening. It gives you lots of time to spread out your colors. The reason I asked Morag to stay tuned is Morag was asking about wanting to know about different um, styles of painting. Uh, Morag, what I'm going to do, in fact, the painting that I've chosen to do after this one is finished, is going to be a glaze painting. Uh, because what I've already decided to do is that I will take you through a painting each one of different styles. I'm quite fortunate that I tend to be quite versatile. Um, my natural, I, I don't really have one specific style that I work in. I love working in the old masters techniques as well as something that is more contemporary like the one I'm doing behind me. So my plan was to do this one as a contemporary painting, do the next one as a glaze painting, do the next one possibly as an impressionist painting and so it will go. So if you keep tabs of what paintings we're doing, Every painting is going to be addressing a different style for a certain amount of time and then at the time that I do those paintings I will discuss that particular style of painting, possibly its history, the artist that used it, why they started using it, how it was back in the system, that sort of thing. But particularly we will concentrate on the types of things like uh, um, brush strokes, paint consistency, what it was that uh, that particular style of painting was trying to uh, communicate, how we as modern day artists can draw from what we've been taught by the painters of old and all the different types of, of um, styles that they used. Now also what I want to say to you on this subject is a little while ago I was asked by the South African Artist magazine to prepare a tutorial on glazing. That tutorial comes out in issue number 23 which is the or issue number 22. 22. Uh, that That's tutorial right. comes out I think it's in issue number 22 which is the next issue to come out. I know that they've already prepared the issue um, 21 I think, the one with Morgan Rickett on the front cover, that one's out on the shelves at the moment. Then I'm not sure what the release date is but keep your eyes open because in that issue I did a tutorial. I will not publish it until such time as the issue number 22 is off the shelves because I don't think it's fair on the magazine but I will eventually publish it here. Um, but I did a tutorial there which was a modern day take if you want to call it that, on the old masters glazing where I used imprimatura layer, then grisaille layer, no other um, underpainting layers, just imprimatura, then grisaille, and then glazing, and I, I give a little brief description on each layer and what it takes to go through those layers. So Elise, yours was a very multifaceted question and led to an, an, a, a, quite a detailed answer. Uh, I really do appreciate your question, it was a lovely question to start off with our Q&A sessions with. And Morag, I will be dealing with your question, like I say, over time, so stay tuned. 
Archers, please don't forget to like and share and subscribe to the YouTube channel and keep those questions coming in. This is great interaction. Thank you so much. And I will see you tomorrow in day 49. Bye. That's what you want to do.